Romans chapter 8, and you know, it's, uh, as we look at Ben, uh, I have a gentleman in my church, he, you know, people ask him, well, how are you doing? And I say, well, you know, all things considered, I, I'm really not doing bad at all, and, uh, and that's true. And he says, to him, that's a non-answer. I said, well, to me, it's, it's, the, it's the most appropriate answer for me. I mean, all things considered, I, I'm, doing, I'm doing well. I may hurt here and ache there and this, that, and the other, but uh, when you consider all things... It's not that bad. And as we look at this idea about suffering and sickness and, and grace and the dispensation of grace, it's a, it's a, it's a, a very encouraging topic, if, if you will, because we learn based on what we can learn from the Apostle Paul, and in, in specifically uh, in Romans chapter 8 and various places, that there is, there is a doctrine and there is an understanding of which we can get by, and we can put it into perspective. You know, why do some people suffer more than other people do? Because... You know, the effects of sin, living in a sin-cursed world, affects some people differently than it does others. It's not God. It's not favoritism from God. It's just the way that things are. So we'll take a, take a stab here, Romans chapter 6. We're going to read verses, uh, chapter 8, verses 26 to 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 28. It says, Likewise the Spirit also help with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for another wonderful day of grace. We thank you for the opportunity to fellowship with other believers of like precious mind as we study the truths and principles of your word. As we study... We pray that we will exalt your Son and glorify Him and give Him all the praise and honor that's due. And we ask and pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for His sake. Amen. Well, we look at this and it says, and we know that all things work together for good. You know, the all things here, it's, it's really all things. Now, there's a context to this passage, of course. But all the things that we can put together in, in a... Excuse me one second. <laughs> It didn't take me long to remember I needed this. But, you know, the all things, it's, it's everything that goes on in, in life. And so we put this into perspective, and they work together for good. You know, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you can, you can suffer, you can uh, have illnesses and, and things, but it all works together for good. Because the design in the dispensation of grace is that as we suffer and as we hurt, as we go through life with ailments, there is a way in which we can turn that around to give honor and glory to God. And that's what I think would be pleasing to him. So the, the word likewise means in the, in, the same, in the same manner. And in the same manner the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities, he also does some other things for us. Look at verse 13, chapter 8, verse 13. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. The Holy Spirit is that which can energize us in these bodies of flesh, and he can, he can give us life. In much of Christianity today, though, thinks that the issue and the responsibility for mortifying or putting to death the flesh is my responsibility. But it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and it's my responsibility to let him do that which only he can, he can really do. So he does that. And in verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. So he not only bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God, he helps us in all of our ways and all of our infirmities. Look at verse 16 and 17. He says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and of children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. And then in verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this world, I'm sorry, I'm, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, when we look at this, you know, it's not that what we don't want to do is we don't want to compare our suffering just necessarily with the glory, but we want to do it the other way. We want to, we want to compare the glory which shall be revealed with us and put it into perspective about the suffering that, we're, that we may be doing today. Now, I don't know, is there anybody here this morning that doesn't have a, a, a pain or an ailment? <laughs> you know, it's something that we all have, isn't it? And, and the truth is, as we, we do that and, and we understand that uh, this, the truth about what we're going to uh, uh, study around today is the truth about getting a glorified body. 
one that is absolutely not tainted with sin in the least. It's something that we can, and we can really look forward to this. And so Paul says in verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so we, we look forward to that day of getting those glorified bodies. Look at verse 23. 8.23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. And I tell you, that's a glorious time. I tell you, even if you don't have aches and pains, even if you are in perfect health, um, there's, there's the expectation of everyone being able to look and anticipate uh, receiving their, their glorified body. So how do we know that we're God's child? Well, the reason why we know is the Spirit bears witness with, with our spirit. But how do we really know we're going to get a redeemed body? Well, our redeemed body, is going to, it, it's an issue of our hope. And uh, a lot of times we think about our hope as being the catching away of the believer. And it's that, all that. All tied to that, though, is the issues of when this takes place, we receive our glorified body. Uh, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And this idea of eternal life, you know, if we're going to have eternal life, we're going to have to have another body to experience it with. And so that, become, that becomes part of, a part of our hope. And our hope resides in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is. You know, we often think, you know, there are a lot of people we put a lot of confidence and trust in who would, who would never lie to us uh, on, uh, on purpose. But they don't always, people aren't always able to carry out everything that they, they promise that they'll do. But that's not true with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. You know, so somebody would say, well, is, is Jesus our hope? Is, is our hope the, the catching away the believer? Is our hope going to be the glorified body? And the answer is yes. It's all that. But it all comes to us because of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for him, the things that he accomplished for us and on our behalf, you know, we, would, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to have confidence in that. But the issue then is going to be an issue of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, usually when we talk about faith, we think it's, you know, it's, it's something less than tangible. We think it's something that's perhaps uh, would be intangible, be something which is, you know, you, you can't, you, you have to take it by faith. And sometimes faith that we say, we, can, we can't see it. But here, you know, faith as it, as, it, uh, as it relates to what we're doing and how we're getting on in life with that, the issue of faith, it's the substance. It is tangible. And I'm, I'm glad that, that we can have a relationship. We can have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ today. We can have a relationship with these as yet unredeemed bodies that, that may be failing us and letting us down. And yet, based on faith, we, it's the substance of which we can, can see and get ourselves, get ourselves through. So if biblical faith is not some intangible feeling or emotion. It's real and it's, and it's tangible. Come back to Romans chapter... 8, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 23 to 25. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that, we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it. You know, it, the idea of hope and faith and what God is doing today. You know, once again, uh, no one's ever seen their glorified body. But I believe I'm going to get one. And, uh, and I trust many, many, many do. And, and the reason that we're going to be able to look and to see this is that 
what we're doing is that we wait. Verse 23 again. It says that not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting <laughs> for the adoption to it. And we're going to wait for, for the re redemption of our body. But it, it's, it's a, something we're going to realize. And what we do is we groan for our, our new bodies. And, and a new body is what we're going to get. Come to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You know, one of the things he's going to subdue unto himself is these wretched, old, vile, fleshly bodies. And when we get our old one, the power that he has in here, it will, will be transformed as we get our new glorified bodies. So is just getting the new body, is, is that what we groan for? Is that what we wait for? Is that what we're patiently in, uh, enduring? You know, when we think about what's going on there, you know, uh, some people think that the hope of the believer is just fulfilled when we get rid of these bodies of sin but ours is not just about getting rid of these bodies of sin but it is in fact getting the new body come to second corinthians chapter four. Second corinthians chapter four second corinthians chapter four and verse 15 it says for all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but th uh, through our, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So, uh, Paul's illustration here, the outward man perishes. You know who he's talking about, don't you? This. But the inward man, that's the new creature that we are in Christ. That's the one that, that uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're new creatures in Christ. And that's where the inner man is. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, Strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. We talk about that and how the, the new man is renewed after, uh, after the knowledge of the, uh, the image of Him that created Him. That's the new man. And it's renewed day by day, but you know, it doesn't necessarily just renew itself. Now, it'll, it'll, never, it'll never die out, we'll never lose our salvation, but the ability that we have to be able to live and to focus and see everything that's going on around us and still patiently wait in hope, even though we have these conflicts, is because our new man is being renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We think about after the image, of the, of the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We think about the image of, uh, of him and, and the glorified body that he received and the fact that we have been promised the same. So it says that, and he says in verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, I'm, I'm, I never remember if I'm 61 or 62, but... That's pretty close. Whatever the age it is, you know, been, been around for a while. You know, my wife says in five years, I don't remember even that much. <laughs> you know, she says, you, you're, you're 62. So, okay, well, I'm going to be 62. But as we think about that, we, we, <laughs> we, uh, we take a look and we recognize that, you know, for our light afflictions. Now, if you put up with an affliction for 60-something years, 70-something years, 80-something years, 90-something years, you know what it really is? It's just a light affliction. No matter how much we struggle and how much the conflict is or how much the pain is or how much the suffering or what we believe that it may be, um, it's a light affliction. It says in verse 18, While we look not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And I'm glad about that. I'm glad if I'm going to have to lose something that it's going to be this body. And the one that I've never seen, but the one that I believe I'm going to get because I, I believe what my, my Bible says about it, that is something that will just, it's going to last for eternity. 
It will never wear out. It will never be contaminated and affected by, the, by living in a sin-cursed world as it is today. But you know, the, the hope of the believer is not just to lose this body. Once again, chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You know, part of what God's going to do at the appropriate time, He will unite our new man with His new glorified body. And, uh, and so we, we have that expectation. And we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the, in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. And so we groan earnestly. Because we, we don't want to just get rid of those. We want everything that God has for us. And so we want this glorified body because it is, it's going to be absolutely perfect, perfectly designed to do anything and everything that we're going to need to do for eternity. But it says we, we, uh, we groan earnestly. You know, when I got up this morning, I, uh, I thought what I was hearing was it was like a, a, a locomotive on on railroad tracks, you know how they squeal and they scrape and they get going by. And I said, well, I don't remember a railroad track being around. And I remembered that, you know, we're in a, a hotel full of believers. And I think what I was hearing was all these believers getting out of bed so they could come here at the 7 o'clock service. <laughs> and that was that groaning that was going on. <laughs> and people said, oh, my, you know, we got, uh, we got to move around a little bit. We got to stretch and... And so, so we, we do that, and they come. But what we want is, is to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. You know, once a year, I, I guess you all are the once a year club too, you know, you go in for your, your annual physical from your doctor. And, I, and as my doctor was going over the litany of things that, uh, that I, I deal with, you know, he says, well, you know, you got a little bit of this, you got a little bit of that, and a little more of this, and a little less of that, and, and everything went through. And he, he looked up at me, and he says, well, the good news, you got a lot of things wrong with you, but, you know, the, you know it's not terminal. You're not really, I'm not expecting you to die anytime soon. And I just gave him that blank stare. And <laughs> he says, so I'm not going to die? He says, no, not, not anytime soon. I said, man, I can't catch a break. <laughs> you know, now, I'm glad this isn't being recorded and going out live on the Internet because my wife heard that. She would not think that was funny at all. <laughs> so we'll just keep that as our secret. But, but, you know, that's the thing. I mean, you know, you know of course, I'm not ready to die. I'm, I'm still enjoying life and wanting to be a part of that. But the idea is when you do die, you win. <laughs> you know, you, you, get, you, you win the prize. You get to go home. But as we think about living our life and, and uh, living in this sin-cursed world, we think about all that's going on here. And we say in verse 3 of chapter 5, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life, eternal life. Now, our eternal life started for us the moment that we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for our Savior. And you know, everything that we have for eternity, we are in possession of already, except for our glorified body. That's the one thing that the believer has yet to look forward to, and is that. Now, there's a purpose and a reason why God didn't just give us our glorified bodies up front. Because this is the way today that a believer has the, the ability then, if you will, to be able to stand and to be able to show the strength and the power of God as we continue to live in this sin-cursed world. Come back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 to 18. It says, The Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I know people who look at the suffering and they say, how can my life be representative of, of suffering? We, we know people who throughout history, they really suffered for their identification with the Lord. And so what is my ability and what chance do I have to, um, 
to be a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have to suffer, if suffering is as everyone else has ever suffered. People have been burned at the stake for their testimony for the Lord. People have lost life. They've lost jobs. They've lost family. They've lost, their losses just continue to go and go and go. Well, if that's the suffering that Paul's talking about, um, you know, I don't deserve much because life's been pretty good. But the suffering of this present time has nothing to do with that. The suffering of this present time has everything to do with the waiting for our, the redemption of our bodies, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which had the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. And for a believer, our citizenship is in heaven. Our, that's where we belong. That's, where, that's, that's what God has in store for us. But until, we have, until the Lord comes back and gets us, you know, we're, we're here. And you know what? There's not been a, a believer that ever suffered uh, any different than the other believer when it came to living in this sin-cursed world with our as yet unredeemed bodies. That's the suffering that everybody goes for. We all qualify based on that. If I had to compare uh, my life with the life of others, my suffering's not so much. But when I think about living in a sin-cursed world in an as-yet-unredeemed body, every believer suffers the same fate because heaven's our home and not, and not this. Look at verse 19. It says, For the creature, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You know, we all, when we think about Adam and Eve and the sin in the midst of the garden, and we understand that, you know, man, you know, you know been cursed to live in a sin-cursed world. Now, we think about man being cursed. But we don't think about the fact, as often, that creation was also cursed. That uh, when God took this uh, garden, He planted eastward in Eden, it was, it was perfect. There was no contamination of, of the earth by sin at that time. But when Adam and Eve sinned, God not only put a, a judgment on mankind, there was also a judgment that went upon the earth. And it says in verse and it says in verse uh, 20, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly. <laughs> Creation didn't have anything to do with that. But it was made subject to vanity, which, it, which has the idea of being morally corrupt. And God judged the earth, and God judged it as morally corrupt. Now, He did so for a particular reason, and only in the wisdom of God. Just as today, because all of mankind are now identified with Adam in Adam's sin, you know, how many, how many redeemers did God have to send for man? Just one. But if, if we didn't take our place with Adam and his headship in this idea, then there would have had to be multiple, multiple redeemers. And there was never going to be more than one who was going to qualify, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't, he didn't subject it to vanity, not willingly, not by him, not by something that, that creation had done. He says, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Creation, cursed, but God didn't curse it without hope. Just as in Genesis 3, 15, you know, Adam and Eve, they sinned, but God promised a, a, the coming of a future redeemer. They were cursed, but not without hope, not without knowing that at one day there was going to be one who could redeem them. And the same thing as it is for creation. All of creation judged, but there only need to be one redeemer. And somehow, you know, I, I don't think God's got any trouble talking to his creation. He says, listen, this judgment is going to come upon you as well, but there is hope for you. And it says in verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What creation is doing is creation is looking for that moment when God does something magnificent with the children of God. And that's going to be the day when we receive our glorified bodies. Verse 20, 22, 
For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain until now. And not only they, not only creation, but we do too. We groan and travail together in pain. You know, so, you know, we look at, we see what's going on, but and what, what is that creation is, is waiting for? Creation is waiting for the catching away of the church, the body of Christ. He says in verse 21, because the creature itself shall be delivered from this bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You know what creation's waiting on? They're waiting on the rapture. Creation's waiting on the rapture. Creation's waiting on the, on the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ to come and to catch away the church, the body of Christ, because they know that in just a short time they're going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption itself. It's a glorious day for, for creation. You know, you read back in the Old Testament when the, you know, all, the, um, in, in all the things that are going to be taken care of in the world with the, the kingdom coming and, and all, but there's a, an event that has to happen first. And that event has to do with the church, the body of Christ, being, being caught away. So even though God cursed the earth, he did, so, he did so with hope. And we come along, it says, in verse 23. He says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. Now, that's an interesting word right here, that the, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our bodies, because what are we doing? Well, adoption has the, you know, it's, it's about the placing of sons. And that, once again, that's why we would say, you know, we've received everything from God already except for that glorified body. And we're going to wait for the adoption to wit. And that adoption, that at the, that, that point in time in, in creation and history and all that's going on, the believer is going to be put on display as being the children of God because we will receive our glorified body. He says, so, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. And, you know, when we talk about groaning, you know, I'm growing. I'm gro I, I'm, I can groan, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and growing has the idea of, of, of sighing. And my wife says, what are you sighing about? And the only, only one that I know that sighs even more than I do is my uh, my son's boxer, you know, he sighs all the time. I said, what is, what is wrong with that dog? And my wife said, he's kin to you. That's what's wrong with him. <laughs> well, you know, so he, he does. You know, a lot of times he, he's staying with us now for a while, and he'll sleep in the chair over beside him, and, and I'll wake up, and that dog is just, he just one great big sigh after another. But I, you know, he's happy. But the idea of groaning here. And, and the sighing, it's not that we groan as in complaining. This has to, this has to be done with the attitude of, of what, and the expectation that we have and the idea of patience and all that's going in here. It's, we groan, but it's with cheerful endurance. Now, you try groaning with cheerful endurance. You know, you're going to have to have the help of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to put it into perspective for us because left our own devices, the groaning that we have ultimately or many times just turns into complaining. But that's not the idea here in this passage at all. The idea here is that we are well suited to live in this world in our as yet unredeemed bodies and we can do so and it's not an endurance contest and we can do so with cheerful endurance. You know why we can do that? We live in the age of grace. It says in Romans chapter 5, it says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And the sin that, that, that racks these bodies, whatever sin was, grace did much more abound. Grace is, doesn't even come close to not being able to handle our needs in the dispensation. You know what that takes, though? It takes faith, doesn't it? It takes faith to, to be looking at something which seems to be so obvious. And yet what we want to be able to do is to take it by faith and say, we can, we can handle this. We can certainly, uh, certainly do this. Today men put on some pretty big shows. You know, we have the Super Bowl halftime show, Macy's Day Parade, and, and we probably all just watch some really fantastic fireworks. But we're waiting for the adoption to wit, our glorified bodies, 
that everything man could ever put on is going to pale when we get to experience when we get to experience that. And the thought is our weakness is the fact that we're living in sin cursed bodies. Likewise, the spirit spirit also helpeth our infirmities. It's not talking. It's not really talking about the 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 physical things that are wrong with us. It's talking about the one thing that's truly wrong with us and it's living in sin-cursed bodies. So when we think about what's going on here, we think about the ministry of the Spirit helping our infirmities and um, when it comes to, it comes to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 again, it says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, I look at this and I say, well, like, it's true. You know, many times and a lot of times, I don't know how to pray, even though maybe I should. I don't know how to pray for as we ought. The one thing I know that we don't pray for today or don't need to pray for, or if we do pray for it, don't really have any expectation that God's going to do anything, is to pray for physical healing. You know, that, that was something that went out. <laughs> you know, under the kingdom program, people didn't have to groan. They didn't have to, they weren't waiting for the redemption of their, uh, their bodies. What they were doing, they, they could experience physical healing. And God could heal them in a physical way. So there wasn't, there wasn't that identification with us. And so we don't pray for physical even, healing, even though physical healing was a part of God's program in the past. Come to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark 16, verses 16 through 18. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Well, was there an expectation of physical healing in time past? Sure, there was. The Lord Jesus Christ, during His earthly ministry, as He walked through, the, walked through Galilee, he, he, just, he was just healing the masses as He went. Come to Mark, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Beginning of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all of Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people and them that were taken with diverse diseases and torments and, uh, and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy. And he healed them. He healed every single one of them. He's just walking through, the, through the, 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 the region and had the ability to heal people. They had this great prayer promise in, in, a, in a time past. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 11 through 14. He says, believe uh, me that I, am, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he also do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. They had the power. His uh, disciples had the power to, to heal. Christ had the power to heal. And uh, healing was a part of the program of the day. In fact, it had to be evidenced as part of the program of, of the day. You know, some are, as we think about this, and, and uh, today people look and they say, somebody will, will be praying that they will be healed and they're not healed. And you know what, some, someone will come along and just say, well, it's because something's wrong with your faith. You need to have greater faith. Well, Look, look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 and verse 6.
And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this mountain, uh, say unto the sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and thou be planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Well, anybody know what the, how big a mustard seed is? <laughs> I had a, a gentleman associated with that ministry many years ago. He gave me a, a mustard seed, and it was a real tiny thing, but it was in a great big magnifying bubble. And, you could, and then you could still barely see it. So someone comes along and they says to them, you know why you're not being healed? You don't have enough faith. And I'm sure they're thinking, I, I have faith where I believe that Christ died for my sin, and yet I don't have enough faith for God to heal me? And so the questions of doubt and the questions of God's sincerity and his loved one for the other uh, begins to run rapid. And it's here, if we're not careful in, in, uh, in our thinking, this could become a rub for us. Because, you know, we all know about Lazarus. And uh, the Lord loved Lazarus. And what did he do for Lazarus? He raised him from the dead. Well, I think about that and I say, well, look, I, I don't need to be raised from the dead. All I need is just, you know, them to tweak up my physical body a little bit and help me get through the next few years. My question is, did God, did the Lord love Lazarus more than he loved me? And if I didn't have some dispensational understanding, how could we put this into perspective? How could we put this into perspective of, of, of what to think about that? You know, we come along and we say, ask anything in my name and I'll do it. You know, when my flesh reads about verses like that, you know, it's a, it says, man, I'd like to take that out around the block a couple of times. I think around the second time, I'd be healed. But I know that's not going to happen. I truthfully can't ever remember if I ever prayed to ask God to heal me. I know I haven't in the last 30 plus years since my understanding of grace and the dispensation of grace. And that today, God's principle is not to, to work in us physically, but it's to work in us spiritually. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. And how many times would we have to pray, say, God, would you heal me? And he would. Would it make that verse not true? It don't have to happen one time. It's just not going to happen. But if you are going through this life and you haven't been healed, you know, we're really in pretty good company. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Second Corinthians 12, verse 7. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, I'm sure this took Paul some time to come to grips with. I mean, the Apostle Paul was one who had seen people healed by his ministry. There was, he had such power to heal that people could just come along and bring handkerchiefs and aprons and they could brush up against his body and then they could just go give it to someone who was sick and infirmed and they would be healed. Paul even saw someone raised from the dead. So here's Paul now, a few years you know, into his ministry, and he's praying. He says, man, I've got this thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. I don't think Paul was thinking he was demonically indwelled. The messenger of Satan, as Paul was looking at it, he said, I've got this physical issue, and it's hurting my ministry. 
So he beseeches the Lord, and he's going to pray three times. He says in verse 7, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given unto me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Why do you think Paul ended up praying for this thing three times? Because when he prayed the first time, he probably said, I can't believe God didn't heal me. When he prayed the second time, he says, now wait a minute. What's going on? I can't believe God did not heal me. And then the third time when he prays it, he says, oh boy. But Paul learned something. Because every single time that he prayed, God answered his prayer. He prays the first time, and instead of healing him, he says, Paul, things are different today. It is no longer I'm going to be manifesting myself through, through your, your physical bodies. It's spiritual now. And he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. Second time Paul prays. The Lord says to him, Paul... My grace is sufficient. I have answered your prayer. My grace is sufficient for thee. The third time he says, My grace is sufficient for thee. And it wasn't that Paul was being stubborn or hard-headed. This was different. Later on, Paul says, And Trophimus have I left in my leadum sick. Why? Things were changing. You know, you don't think Paul could have gathered up a couple people to... Uh, uh, join an agreement pair, uh, a prayer for Trophimus. We have a dear brother, Trophimus, part of our internet ministry. He's up in northern Wisconsin, sick. You know, so we think about that, and we think about all the things and all the sickness that we see around people, and people want encouragement, and people want, but they think they want something that God isn't doing today. And it's perhaps because they haven't really been exposed to what God really is doing. And once Paul realized what God was doing, he says in verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know, Paul began to understand the program, the way it's really working today. There was that transition period when Paul was able to demonstrate the signs of an apostle. He could do it all. But now things are, things are different. And as Paul looks at that, he says, listen, he came to the conclusion, I don't, I don't want physical healing anymore. Because what I really want is for my life and the decisions that I make and the attitudes that I have going through this life, groaning with cheerful endurance, because when I do that, I exalt the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I do that, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And what is the power of Christ? The power of Christ is, is the grace that comes to, uh, to Paul that will see him through whatever it may be. He says, therefore, whatever it is, I don't want the healing. I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecution and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And Paul, as he became strong, of course, what Paul became strong in was the strength and the power of recognizing who he is in Christ. He became, in becoming weak, he became strong. He was able to endure because he had faith in God and what God was doing today and the grace that God had given him to accept that. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for who you have created us to be in Christ. We pray that our life would be the living example of everything that you have created us to be. May when people see us, they will see your life living through us in power and in glory as we patiently wait for the redemption of our bodies. And we give you the praise and glory for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.